Welcome to episode 36 of the RSA Resident and Student Podcast Series, a production of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. RSA is an accessible, collaborative organization that fosters innovation, education, and advocacy for residents and students in emergency medicine. In this episode, Dr. Pooja Gopal, resident at University of Illinois at Chicago and former RSA Education Committee Chair, speaks with Dr. Teresa Chan, Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at McMaster University. Today, Drs. Gopal and Chan discuss secrets and hacks to assist with scholarly success. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us on another edition of AEM RSA Podcast. I'm Pooja Gopal, a current resident at University of Illinois at Chicago and the AEM Education Vice Chair. I'm really excited to be bringing you this podcast straight from the Core Academic Assembly 2017 at Fort Lauderdale. Here today with me, I have Dr. Teresa Chan, who I'm really excited to have. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Chan, can you tell us a little about your background? Okay, so my name is Teresa Chan, and I am a Canadian. So I come from Hamilton, Ontario, which is a little city basically outside of Toronto. We're like the Brooklyn of Toro- uh, Toronto, basically. We have a university called uh, McMaster University, and that's where I am a faculty member. My areas of interest are medical education, and specifically one of the areas of interest that I do have is helping to mentor residents and junior faculty kind of through their junior faculty and resident woes, uh, especially around scholarship. Okay, wonderful. So one of the sessions you're doing at CORD this year is entitled Writing Your Stuff Up, Secrets and Hacks to Assist with Scholarly Success. So residents often want to write publications as well as junior faculty members want to be involved in scholarly work. What are some strategies they can use to overcome something like writer's block? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think writer's block is one of the things that really gets to a lot of people. I think there's also imposter syndrome that probably comes before that, that I'm not a good writer, I'll never be a good writer. The same way that we all think that we can't draw after the age of eight, right? Like we all think, oh, I'm not a good artist and never will be, you know, like I didn't win the art award when I was a grade three and all of a sudden you've decided you're not an artist, right? I think we do the same thing with writing. And I think that a lot of us who gravitated towards the sciences It might have been that we were not as strong at the writing, so that we're not now English majors and historians and and, and people in the social sciences for which writing and reading and then writing and then reading and then writing were things that they had to be super strong at in order to be successful in those fields. So a lot of us were really good at, you know, maybe memorizing and maybe regurgitating at times or maybe creative problem solving, but in a very regimented or specific way. And then now you're suddenly in residency, and they're like, now you have to do writing again. You're like, I haven't written anything since that mandatory class that made me take in first year undergraduate before med school, and it was on, you know, an area that I can barely remember. I can't remember when I wrote my last essay, right? And so I think scholarship is one of those things that seems very daunting because it's probably a skill that we don't practice as much as doctors, right? Most of the time we're busy training to be doctors, being the best doctor that we can be, and then being that amazing clinician that we all dream to be. And yet the academic emergency physician is also asked to be someone that can do other things. And the currency of academia, you know, the ivory tower, is, is still largely written publications that are cited and disseminated uh, across the world, right? So that's how universities are marked and your reputation at university goes up if you have more citations and you for a tenure and promotion, if you're a junior faculty member, are graded on that. When someone's looking to hire you as a new staff when you're finishing residency, your track record, your academic track record is actually really important, right? So that is the reality of the world that we live in if you're interested in pursuing academic work in emergency medicine. And scholarship can take so many different forms. I'm specifically interested in education, so I tend to write about innovations in education, but I also write reflective commentary papers about, like, the process of it, and then I do, like, research work. So I kind of write different kind of styles, and each of them has their rhetorical structure. Each of them has different styles, and you have to learn them all, right? It's kind of like fashion, right? Like, (laughs) there's different ways to write each of these things, and there's an art that you take some time to learn. So I think that being generous with yourself and, and acknowledging that 
yeah, it's been a while, but I could do this and having that growth mindset is probably really important. So the first barrier is to break down the fact that you don't think you can write. The second thing is to acknowledge that writing is a team sport in medicine, which is great. And so you kind of need to know who you are in that team. Just like a baseball team, there's some people that are pitchers, some people that are catchers, some people that are first basemen. Different people have different roles. And knowing what kind of role that you like to do in a team, for instance, I am the girl that writes the first shot workshop. I get words on a page like nobody's business. It is not elegant. I have definitely situations where I'm like, I'm super not proud of it, but at least it's down on paper. And I often surround myself with people who are fairly critical editors so that I get the first shot, worst shot down. And we all acknowledge that it is the worst shot, but at least the logic is there. My strength is that I like to storyboard, kind of like, you know, how Pixar storyboards cartoons out. I storyboard using sticky notes. I storyboard out the logic statements of and the arguments of a paper. And then I turn those into linear paragraphs and build. And so what I do there is I, I do that. And then I get like each sticky note basically essentially is a thought that translates into a paragraph. And then what happens is that I have friends and collaborators who are good at editing. Like they're very responsive. They like can't get that first draft done. Like when it comes to like their thesis, like they're like the kind of people that were like stare at a blank page for like hours. But if you give them something, they're super hypercritical. And that's great because they rake over that first shot, worst shot with like over the coals and then give you lots of feedback. And they edit it and they wordsmith it and they're good at that. So I have found myself draft picking my teams to make sure there's someone that does the first shot, someone that does that final OCD, like, do we have double spacing before, like, after a period or single spacing after a period? Do do we have Canadian or American spellings? Have we adhered to all the guidelines of the journal? (laughs) Like, someone that does that kind of stuff, detail-oriented people, Um, and then then people that are good at editing. So I think that that's all stuff that you can think about when you're writing, is that it's not, it it feels less lonely when you feel, realize that writing can be a team sport. Another thing that you can think about is that you don't get good at something if you don't do it often, regularly, with feedback. So the idea of like Erickson's deliberate practice model, if you want to get good at central lines, guess what? You do a central line, you get feedback on it, and you do the next one, and you do the next one, and you do the next one, right? You're going to get better if you're coached. It's like piano lessons all over again, or ballet lessons, or swimming lessons. Get someone to coach you. Get, put yourself out there, get feedback, and then turn it back. One of the things you can do to help with that will be to have friendly reviewers that can kind of go over your stuff and again rake it over the coals give you feedback and and help you through drafts to drafts having a platform where you can write regularly is also something that can help with that deliberate practice putting yourself out there getting feedback but also just having a product so a lot of people have turned to the blogosphere as a way to kind of like get their writing down in at least a certain format and it's it's far more approachable to write a blog post than it is to write a whole review paper. And I think you can really kind of cut your chops on learning that skill of writing and that fluency that you need again if you're just getting started after having not, let's say, written an essay for eight years. So I think that that's important. I think embracing that virtual community practice that's online, like the FOMED community, people are fairly welcoming. And they say, this is my first blog post. People will like retweet that and they'll, they'll spread the word. But they'll also comment and say, you know, like, and if you ask an experienced blogger, like, can you give me feedback? I mean, most people will make five, ten minutes out of their time and, like, write down some comments or give you some suggestions. And some of them will do that before you even publish something. So you can get involved, let's say, with some of the mega blogs that are accepting new submissions. And you can write for them instead of having to, like, do it all yourself. So to be a freelance blogger <laughs> for a little while and apprentice under some of the best. Like, I know Alium definitely does accept new submissions. Canadian has a whole process called coach peer review process, where actually, if you're a resident or a med student or a pre-med person, we will definitely match you up with a coach that actually coaches your peer review. We wrote about that in academic medicine. And it's like, basically, the idea is that we don't say no to learner written pieces. We say yes, and here are all the corrections we would like you to make. And it can go three or four or five rounds before you know, everyone's happy. There's usually a copy editor, a senior editor, a copy editor, and 
um, an expert peer reviewer who will go through the stuff in a couple of rounds. So the last one I worked on was a little mnemonic and little write-up about the heart score, which was written by a, a bunch of collaborators in the Netherlands. And the lead author of that paper actually is still an R3 resident in the Netherlands, Barbara Bacchus. And so we like reached out to her on Twitter and said, hey, would you peer review a submission by one of their med students? And she happily obliged. And so we went a couple of rounds until she was happy with the content, at least. She's like, it's not like my style, but it's acceptable. Like, it's fine. And then so she gave feedback to our med student. He revised and revised. And then it's about to be published in the next couple of weeks. So that's pretty awesome. And yeah, so I think that you can definitely reach out into a community where you can actually get engaged and get apprenticed into being a better writer. I think that's the real advantage of the academic blogosphere right now as manifest in FOMED. I think that the other thing that you can do is look at creating a network or a peer support group of other writers, kind of like a knitters club or whatever. Like sometimes misery love company and sometimes it's nice, you know, just like you would with studying or whatever, to just have another colleague who's also on research block with you or is doing some other kind of scholarly work. And you just set up an appointment that you can't miss and just have them hold you accountable, right? Because I think it's nice to say, no, three to five, I'm meeting with Susan. And we're going to sit at Starbucks and we're going to write our first draft. That's our goal. And there's lots of collaborative tools if you're working on the same manuscript, or you might just be doing parallel play. So I think there's like some tangible tricks. The Academic Life in Emergency Medicine blog or alium.com, we have a five tips for battling academic writer's block, which were some insights that the faculty incubator participants for our first round, which is last year, they're about to graduate in a couple of days, so it's pretty exciting. They wrote this last year, and it's still something that I think would resonate with most people. So check that out, um, and it kind of goes through some of the tips. We talked about them today, like the idea of get yourself into a space. Like they kind of go into some other tips as well, like get, making sure you prime yourself with like triggers and like sensory triggers. Like you like to have a cup of coffee, make sure you have a cup of coffee. That's great. Or like having many more people to collaborate with or starting with the end in mind or build and iterate your, you know, using the the sticky notes and prototyping your paper. And then the idea of trying to go through many different things and reach higher than you should, maybe, for a journal that might give you a chance, you know. I think those are all things that you can kind of give a shot and see if it works for you. Mm -hmm. Well, you actually already answered my next question, which was going to be how can residents be more involved in scholarly projects? And I think you gave some really good examples of being involved through Allium, Canadium, um, with blog posts or with writing review articles. Now, is there an algorithm for taking projects from an idea to like the implementation part of the scholarly process? Okay, so you're talking about how do you get from zero to hero? Exactly. Yeah? Okay. So our paper that's in Academic Emergency Medicine Education and Training, the new journal, The lead author is Michael Gottlieb, and he is not here right now, but he is amazing. And he's one of those hyperproductive junior faculty members that I think everyone wants to be like Mike, you know? This was born out of a conversation that we had online, and I told him how I have a mentor named Jonathan Sherboneau who's always telling me, go for multiple wins. And so he's like, has anyone written that up? Because that's the way he thinks now. And I was like, I don't know. And so we reached out to Sherboneau, and we talked to him, and And it didn't seem like it'd be kind of well documented, the concept of what multiple wins looks like, at least in the digital era. So we ended up writing that paper up. And Mike's an ultrasound fellow right now. He's going to be junior staff at Rush, I think. It's pretty cool to have those collaborative networks where you can kind of reach out to mentors and have, he assembled a team, right? And he got us all behind him and we used a Google Doc to start and we brainstormed the ideas and then he refined them, organized it, and then asked us to look at it again, and we iterated and iterated until, you know, like we submitted something. And then, of course, the journal then gives you lots of feedback. So we did, like, I think three rounds of revise and resubmit with the journal to more iteration. And now it's, like, it's online first right now. It's not in this month's, not in April's edition, but it'll come out at some point. And there's a manuscript online, so if you guys want to see hints and stuff like that, definitely check it out. But I think that what that paper kind of, like, highlights is that You can think about gathering the team, banding them around a cause, and then we're presenting the same concepts as our workshop. And then we're also, we've written the manuscript and we submitted that for publication and it's going to be accepted. So this is an opportunity for us to talk about the same thing 
a couple of times, which allows you to like keep the momentum up. One of the things that recently came to me is that just like there's early goal directed therapy, I wonder if we should be having early goal directed writing. And so the idea would be let's like figure out what that protocol is, all the steps. And there's usually the same steps, right? You have an idea, you do a lit review, you do something, whether that's conduct the research, do the review, you know, go through a thousand abstracts and try to find the papers you want for a systematic review, whatever it is, you do, you do the work, run your research project, pro- evaluate the program that you implemented, right? And then you need to sit down, you got to write the first thing, and then you got to find your collaborators and make sure that they all contribute to meet the standards of what an author should be, right? And then you need to, at some point, edit it internally, and then take a deep breath and submit it so they can get external peer review, right? And, and hopefully, you can kind of plan ahead, knowing that you might reach a little too high, like you might shoot for academic medicine, and you're like, if, they get re- if it gets rejected, you're like, well, I thought it would be. Um, and then you work your way down, maybe the impact factor list or just the reputation of their journal as to how hard it is to publish it, right? Like, annals is hard to publish in, but why not try? Because if it goes for peer review, you'll get great. Like, you might still get rejected after peer review, but you'll get comments back maybe, right? And so most of the time, most journals, they allow you to, like, flag that you're a resident or a junior faculty member in your first five years, and you can check the box. And most of the time, at least the editor will give you feedback as to why your paper wasn't up to snuff. And then at least you get that feedback. So hopefully you can take it on the chin and like take that and be like, OK. But then what you do is you take that feedback and you incorporate it and you make the paper better for the next journal that you submit to. And so aiming too high is never really a problem because the worst they could do is say no. But you knew they were going to say no either. And if you didn't ask them, they can't say maybe. Right. And I've had papers that I'm like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, I got to revise and reconsider. And that's great because that means that they're like, no, no, we'll look at it again. Yeah, just make your changes. Right. And in a lot of journals, that's code for if you make all your changes, then we'll probably accept you. You know what I mean? So I think that that's kind of like the idea. That's like the algorithm for following through. I think that with a lot of resident projects and this may be because of your mentorship, might be the track record and success that your mentors have had. But a lot of people are gun shy and they kind of present and then they, it falls flat. Like, oh, I presented at Cord or I presented at SAEM. And then that's like, yeah, I presented and then gone, right? So, what I usually tell my mentees to do if they can is have that first shot, worst shot with them at the conference when they present the poster. You get the abstract done, you have your concept, you've done your analysis, you're not far from your manuscript. So when you're submitting your abstract, that should be the first little bit of your manuscript. And then you fold in and write the rest of it, even if it's shoddy, if it's like you have stick drawings for like your figures, like who cares, right? Get it down, bring it in a printed double space format at your poster. And when people ask you that really great question or that oral uh, presentation, people ask you that really great question. You know what? Scribble some notes the moment you step down from the podium away from your poster. Right? Get that feedback, incorporate it into the manuscript, and then that way your threshold is way lower and you'll ride the high of presenting that poster, getting that feedback, getting the insights from people. In the next week or two, like revise it. Revise it as if it was, you know, your mentor is going through it and just finish it off and then, and then see if you can ride that momentum to the fin- finished product. Right? If you don't see the end goal of being a manuscript that you can like email around the PDF to your mom and say, hi! I got published. If you don't think of that as the end point, but you think of the poster as the end point, you'll stop at the end point, right? It's like if we say the map has to be 65, we achieve the end point, then your map is 65, right? But if we say that and you also have to have this and that and this, well, then we'll have different end points and you can get to that end point, right? So if you don't think of the end in mind, then you can't get there. And there's lots of opportunities to think about scholarship in non traditional platforms as well. There's Journals like Curious.com, which is started by a neurosurgeon, and they're open access platform both ways. So it's free to submit right now still, and it's free to publish and access on the other side. So you don't have to pay $4,000 for an OA publication. You, just, you have to like do a lot of the legwork of recruiting your own reviewers and stuff like that, but it's pretty upstart and very disruptive, and I kind of love it. There's also avenues like JetEM, and it's a place where you can a clearinghouse basically for peer reviewing of curricula. So if you made a, like a really cool little boot camp for the interns or something like that as a meta fellow or like you're a chief resident and you have like a wellness curriculum that you've made, 
Well, guess what? Write it up for Jet EM. Get it peer reviewed, right? And then it's like in a peer reviewed journal. How awesome is that, right? Yeah, think about the dissemination as part of your duty as someone who's done great work that you should make sure other people can steal your great work and do it at their shop, right? Don't think of it as something that has to be singular, that, you know, like that, that you're done, you've done it once, we'll just do it again next year, right? There's a way to like magnify your effect and make sure that people around the world could get inspired by your idea. I don't know, if you give a great lecture or run a good classroom activity, there's the idea series for Alium, which is the Innovations in Didactics and Educational Activities series. And it's one of Mary Haas, and it's like really cool because it's just like a, basically a blog post on like a cool teaching activity you can do. So anyway, these are some suggestions, and there's many ways you can manifest either in a digital sense, uh, some kind of endpoint scholarship, or in a peer-reviewed like publication sense. So there's a wide spectrum. I think that my challenge that people listen to this or that are nerdy enough to have gotten to this point in our podcast, why not give it a shot, right? Obviously, you're motivated enough to have listened this far. What's stopping you? Other than like, yes, rejection burns a little bit. But you know what? The more you get rejected, the less it hurts. <laughs> get used to it. <laughs> or, or you become more resilient because you realize that the rejection is not, it's not you. It's often it's not a good fit for the journal, et cetera, et cetera. It's like relationships. You can't be friends with everyone. You can't marry every person. Like you're going to have some good fits and some bad fits. And that's part of it. That's some very solid advice and some great pearls. Any other common roadblocks that you can think of to the path of scholarship? I think you've discussed quite a few already. So a common roadblock to writing is actually not reading enough. Sometimes what happens is that as a junior author and a junior contributor, you sometimes don't know the lay of the land. And you might not know that your stuff has maybe been done 15 times before because you haven't done the Great Lit Review. And it was an idea, and it's great, and it's innovative for your local setting. But maybe when you're writing it up, you don't really deep dive into the literature enough to know that, you know what, this is totally against like most of the meta literature out there, and it's like based on a paradigm that is maybe thought to be discredited. So like, for instance, if you said this is about adult education, there's a lot of people in medical education that don't believe that adult education is a special kind of education. It's just, there's education. So from that perspective, it's something to think about is knowing the lay of the land. So if the more you can pay attention to table of contents, the more you can make sure you do a great Google Scholar, you don't have to do a formal review, but at least put in your keywords, at least think about what are the key concepts in your piece and see who's written about it before. Maybe click around some references and do a bit of a Alice in Wonderland tour of that area before you write your introduction to discussion, because that reading will save you a lot of pain later when the peer reviewer slaps you with 32 suggested readings that you didn't find. I think there's the fallacy of primacy. Most people often think that what they did was the very first time it was done. And a reviewer, often that's a big red flag as a reviewer. Anytime someone says, oh, this is the first time this has been done. You know what? As a peer reviewer, I will Google Scholar it just to make sure that that's actually the case. And so it's something to think about if you're going to get into scholarly work is that it does require some reading, but just like you would with any essay, you don't dive into a history essay without reading some history textbooks. And you wouldn't write a book report without reading a book, right? So you have to know the grounding literature, you have to understand the work that has been done before, and you have to stand on the shoulders of giants. Even if you're just like a little mouse standing on the shoulder of the giant, and you're only adding just a little bit more, you should acknowledge that all this work has come before and pay your respect. Kind of like the godfather. You gotta kiss the ring. And that's important, right? Because like if you someday are one of those giants, you don't think that you'd be affronted if you had the peer review piece and someone said that it hadn't been done yet and you're like, Yes I have. Here's twenty papers that I wrote on it. What are you talking about, right? And so it's really important to acknowledge that people have come before and they've done great work and that you're here to innovate, build, to really just push the field just a little bit further in your own little way or in your big way, depending on who you are, right? Like, like I said, Barbara Backus, she first authored the heart score paper. Like, that's great, right? As a pre-med student, like, that was her work that she did. That's fantastic. But that's what our field is about, is pushing the envelope, looking for that next great thing. 
And if you can contribute in your way, that's great. Wow. Thank you so much for your expertise and your knowledge and all the, the contributions you've made to our field in emergency medicine. Any other final tips or just thoughts on pursuing scholarly work for anyone interested, med students, residents, or junior faculty members? I'd say for med students, get involved. Be willing to apprentice and learn. Don't expect to be first author because most of the time you'll be coming in on a project for timeline reasons a little later. If you are, be thankful when people give you that opportunity and are willing to coach you through multiple internal revisions until you're ready for peer review. Don't expect your first shot to be the best shot. Always first shot, worst shot, right? Always accept that it's going to be the better with everyone's contributions. Don't get your back up if people are giving you feedback. Same thing with residents. I think as residents, if it's your idea, you know, you, you, you do have to step up and say, I, th- I think that I deserve that this is my idea. I would like to take on the responsibility of what first author and corresponding author means. It means dealing with the really antiquated uploading of a manuscript. It means dealing with reforming the citations when the managing editor writes you an email at three in the morning and says, can you please reformat all your citations into APA format because that's what our journal requirements are? And you're like, oh, I should have read that the first time. But you live, you learn, and the next time you submit to that journal, you know it's an EPA formatting. You have to be willing to put in that elbow grease so that you can learn how to do it that first time. And have that negotiation with your senior author or your mentor so that they have that. We had an alien medic case, medical education and cases series. That's a faculty development slash resident develop soft skills of academia sort of series. We had a fictional case about the honorary author. So you can take a look. Like we had a really good write-ups about like how you define the different roles in an authorship team and how you negotiate that. So definitely check it out. There's lots of stuff. I won't go into it too much, but if you want a how-to on how to negotiate that, that's kind of like a good case to think about and how you can have that upfront discussion before there are words on a page. There's the best time to like have that discussion with your mentor. There's no sense in like having that discussion and then having them like push you to be second author because, you know, the agreement has changed. Making sure you have those upfront adult conversations early on is really good. And then as a junior faculty member, I think it's about learning how to be generous and transitioning from that first authorship. I think you have to do the first authorship stuff. You have to submit and fight with manuscript uploading and doing all the stuff of corresponding author. But like, you know, around the time you've done like five or 10 acts of scholarship that require kind of peer review, you're probably ready to start being generous and start paying back and paying it forward. So find, find that junior mentor, find that resident that you want to take on your wing, find that med student that's super keen and really, really, really wants to help for the project. Find them a little piece of the pie and, and coach them through that process. Because I think you'll learn a lot as a writer when you're helping someone else through the process. And it becomes less painful, but it also then creates that atmosphere of mentorship and helps you learn the craft better through someone else's eyes. So I think that that's what I would say is like the, the advice I would have for each of those stages. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan. Really appreciate you taking out the time to talk to us and our RSA members. Hope to see all you nerds out there. <laughs> Thank you so much. We hope you have enjoyed this podcast from the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. For more information about RSA, please visit our website, www.aaemrsa.org. Listen to all podcasts in this series and explore the ways you can get involved with RSA. Join us again next episode for another topic of importance for emergency medicine residents and students.